to give you a couple of quick little tests about how I see cities, but also give you a couple of my lessons up front. So the biggest lesson that I have for cities is cities are, have a DNA to them, much in the way that I have a DNA. So this is how I started life. Um, when I was three months old, I had hair. And this is what I'm going to become. Right? So I'll be <laughs> my grandfather whether I like it or not. You all see this. As you, as you age, you see your parents come unto you, right? Good habits and bad habits, and you adjust along the way. I look at this guy, this is when I had hair again, too. Um, then my, my, my dad is a, is a model for me in many ways, mostly genetic. I'm genetically Italian, you all, you all can tell that. But we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. So I have to watch what I eat. There's things that I love eating. I love bacon. Can't eat it every day unless I have, I'll have the heart issues. Right? So these are things that we consciously decide. Cities are the same things. What's Austin's future? Where did Austin start? Where's Austin going? Where's your hometown start? And where is it going? So that's one of the first lessons. The second lesson, I'm going to give you all a little test here. Um, this is a sophisticated crowd. You should be able to get this. 42. OK. Have you seen this before? OK. Tell me how many shapes you see in the next image. I'm going to give you five seconds to tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. 42. Ready? <laughs> 42 is not the answer, but oh, it's, good. it's a good close. It's close. So, ready? Tell me how many shapes you see. Go. 43. Nine. Okay. Who's got the answer? We have 42. 20. 4. 9. 63. Anyone want to go higher than 63? 84. 84? Okay. How many kids were on the bus? One. One. What bus? Five. You got it. There are five kids on the bus. Our minds have a way of working. There's a, Daniel Kahneman wrote a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Our brains can filter out information when we're given a problem set. And somehow we can miss all the information that's in plain sight. It's because we've decided to choose that out. I steered the way that you looked at the world based on the question I asked, right? Cities are really, really complex organisms, and when a policy goes through its city council or its a county commission, what ends up happening is we talk about the issue at hand and miss all the other things that are reactive to that. It could be a highway design, it could be a train line. Did y'all get that? So, so basically what I'm trying to do is try to explain how we're missing data that's hiding in plain sight. The work that we do is fairly easy, um, and you, you should be able to pick it up. So the biggest question I want to put before you all is what is a city to begin with? How does a city operate? What's the function of a city? So there's Asheville. This is where I'm from. Uh, we, are, we are definitely in the barbecue zone. We're in the pig section of the barbecue zone, uh, not the cow section. And uh, we're kind of west of the tomato line, not in the vinegar line. We're totally not in the yellow barbecue sauce section of South Carolina. So I just want to make things clear. Y'all had that. It's pretty disgusting. Um, our firm was started by this philanthropist who was essentially an angel investor. He inherited um, a tremendous amount of money, and he took basically $13 million and invested it into a real estate development company. 75% of our money goes into sticks and bricks. We fix buildings. 25% we reserve to seed businesses. We start up businesses like the first vegetarian restaurant, um, our consulting company. These are much like this. It's not as cool as this place, but we basically have businesses that start out of our organization. Our time is a direct opposite. We spend 75% of our time with the businesses and 25% of the time with the, with the buildings. The buildings don't do weird stuff um, or have a party in the restaurant on Easter Sunday that gets a little racy and we might find out about it. So this is one of our buildings, typical real estate development before and after. Um, we did these as four to 600 square foot unit apartments. So I'll ask the question, like this room probably the hands above even <laughs> higher. Who would live in a four to 600 square foot unit? Okay, well that's kind of surprising, four hands. Change the question. Who in this room has lived in a four to six hundred square foot unit? That was our marketing survey. We were told by every bank that this, this would go nowhere, so we just went ahead and operated with one hundred percent equity and did it our way, and it's been very successful. Um, but the key thing about what we do is try to find a way to bring information and data to our community. Even though we're a private sector real estate developer, it's in our community's best interest to understand what's going on in Asheville. I love this quote from Michael Bloomberg. Now, we'll have this all as a PDF if you want to just take it so you don't need to screenshot it. Um, but what's going on by fixing buildings, this is what Asheville was worth 
back in the 90s, these first two steps were just by fixing existing buildings that were there. We didn't get a new building in Asheville until 2008 in our downtown. So those buildings that were abandoned and forgotten about, we were able to cultivate that wealth. And it wasn't just us, there were a handful of developers doing this. So for us, buildings are a lot like crops. There's a value to it, land is finite, you only have so much land in your community. So this is one of our buildings. The city invested in doing a streetscape project and we were accused of being subsidized. Like people actually said, you're subsidizing that developer by building a garbage can, a bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Publicly accessible, by the way, in front of our front door. We took this building from $300,000 of value to $11 million of value. The one way to see that is that was a 3,500% tax in impact on us, right? For fixing a building. We could see it that way. But instead, what we see it as our community now has 3,500% more wealth to do other things. They can do another streetscape project, build affordable housing, whatever, we don't care. It's about building our community's wealth. People say to me, they're like, well, Joe, that's fine, that's, that's, that's $11 million. We've got a Walmart over here that's worth 20 million, right? <laughs> that's much, that's double our building. This is my house, that's my wife, Caroline. These are my dogs, my dogs think they're lions. Um, Caroline and I paid $2,000 more in a tenth of an acre. Or if we had a one-acre cookie cutter that dropped into my neighborhood, it would grab 10 houses, each paying about 2,000 bucks, right? So that's $20,000 an acre. The Walmart pays $221,000 in property taxes, which is a huge number, but it took 34 acres to get there, right? So on a per acre basis, it's producing 6,500. Y'all follow me there? Now if you had an acre of our building downtown, this is what you get. I was in um, Denver, Colorado, trying to present this to people uh, back in February. And I was trying to drive the point home to them in Denver, and I said, look, if y'all had an acre of land to grow something in Denver, what would you grow? Wheat, soybeans, or marijuana? <laughs> they got the joke. Works in Asheville, too, by the way. But um, you're probably saying, you know, Joe, that's not fair. There's retail taxes. That's how you make up your money. All right, let's get rid of us. We don't sell anything in our house. This is what people see, $77 million worth of retail sales. The reality is the city gets a portion of a portion of that. 27 cents out of the eight cents that's created, or 27% of the eight cents. When you run the numbers, it's 4,500. You add that to the property taxes, the total taxes per acre are $51,000 an acre. This is just our property taxes to the city. You add the retail taxes, you're cooking with gas. How do you wanna look at it? Jobs per acre? You know, when you put the numbers up there side by side, hands down, the way that we've always been building cities makes economic sense. So there it is. And this, uh, incidentally, I, I oftentimes recommend the book Moneyball to people. Have you ever read Moneyball? Um, it's really a story about looking at data that people aren't looking at. This is essentially the Moneyball of cities. Um, so realize this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. I'm not a math lead. I don't have a degree in finance. I'm just breaking things down and using land as the least common denominator. So that's the city side. There's also a county side to it. Cities sit inside counties, right? So you're paying a city tax and a county tax. So this is what happens when you look at the county taxes per acre of what a city resident produces in county taxes versus a county resident. See, the city resident's paying about $500 more per acre to the county. You bring them all in at $8,000 an acre in county production, and now you see why an elected official might want to do commercial versus residential, right? Let's go to downtown now. Here's our building. There's the mall at $8,000 an acre. Ours is producing $250,000 an acre in county taxes. So what's good for the downtown is great for the city, but it's unbelievable for the county. When we call, when we have a police issue and call the police, the sheriff doesn't show up. When we have our garbage that needs to be picked up, the county doesn't pick it up. So this is service revenue that's coming out of the downtown and going out to the broader county, right? Y'all get that? So. Thinking about that, what does the government do? Why do we have taxation? How does this all work? Let's just read, this is from Webster's Dictionary. Incorporation is the forming of a new corporation, much like these businesses that are here, right? A corporation may be a business, a nonprofit, or a sports club government of a new city or new city and town. But essentially, the cities and counties are corporations. There's corporate boundaries. You just happen to elect your board of directors. Y'all get that? So the city is a, the citizen, the shareholder in two corporations, and the city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed. It's just a 
profitability. We have a $13 million portfolio. Our city of Asheville is a $10 billion portfolio. My city is worth three times Donald Trump's portfolio. Now does, do you think Donald Trump's looking at his revenue and his, his cash flow? They're looking at his huge financial model, so why aren't we doing it for cities? So getting to where the money comes from, we did a study in Sarasota, Florida, and um, if I were a developer building this godforsaken place somewhere in Arizona, um, we keep track of all the building costs, the buildings, the roads, the, the architect's fees, et cetera, and then <coughs> just divide it by the rooftops. That's how real estate development works. When the government gets this thing plugged onto the street, does the government go out there and assess it based on the cost of, of this community? And the answer is no. They assess it on value, not on cost. Did y'all know that? So, I'm not the first person to kind of wonder, like, why do we do it that way? It actually started with this guy. The Nixon administration published a document called The Cost of Sprawl in 1973. We still haven't caught up to this document, which is kind of scary. Um, but in this, they were looking at pricing out the infrastructure in, the, in the, the residential. The state of Florida did a similar document. And you see that when you spread people out from a residential standpoint, from downtown to a suburban uh, residential area, the more you spread people out, the cost goes up. Does this sound too nerdy for this late at night? Or are you guys mm, you're, good. You're, good. you're good. You're good. Okay. So we grabbed a couple from downtown to the burbs, went out to the burbs and grabbed some multifamily at the edge of the county, 357 units, and we said, let's just go into downtown and let's let them be apples to apples. Let's run the numbers. This is the land consumed in the downtown for 357 units, and that's out at the edge of the community, out in the burbs. Same number of people, one-tenth the land consumed. So one-tenth of your portfolio is exhausted, right? That's one way of looking at it. The cost of infrastructure is 57% as much, yet just going looking right into the tax rolls, this one pays 870% more revenue than that one. So if that's my mortgage, and this one's your mortgage, this is my annual payment, this is your annual payment, how long will it take the two of us to pay off our mortgages, or our debt, or our student loans, whichever way you want to look at it? It's going to take me 42 years, it's going to take you three. So when we look at this and say, okay, well, how do we cash flow this? In real estate development, if I have cost, income, and time, I can do a return rate, a return on investment. So it's an 18% ROI for the urban stuff, it's a 2% ROI for the suburban stuff. So you look at this cash flow, you wonder, well, what's going on? How are we not going broke? Part of it is the revenue return that you're getting out of this is being floated over to other parts of your community to cover those losses. This isn't even keeping up with inflation. I was presenting this in Idaho to a room full of cowboys, seriously, like real cowboys with hats and guns and the whole nine yards. What's that? <laughs> what is, show me your gun. Show us your gun. And I seriously had like sidearms and stuff. We're in Austin. So uh, they said to me, they're like, Joe, these are way too many charts for us cowboys. Just show it to us in year 20. So year 20, this is what it looks like. After 20 years, you're still in the hole five million bucks. Yet over here, you've grown your wealth $34 million. One of the things that's fascinating to me about cities is we don't geoposition our information. We can't capture this data. We don't do this math. And it's kind of, kind of alarming. So realize if you just use the math, if you do the math on these stuff, the, the world becomes more visible to you on what's happening. We've done this all across the country, just mashing up everybody's data, we see the same trend. For every dollar of county single family that's paid by the county, the city resident is paying about eight times that in county taxes per acre. This is stripping out, this one pays the city burden on top of it, which is stripping that out. Just everybody's in the same county together. The Walmart's about seven bucks, the mall's double the Walmart, but as soon as you get to a two-story building, this could be in a small, a small main street or in downtown Austin, it starts to shoot up exponentially. You can cultivate your revenue by just stacking your stories. What we do why, by, excuse me, yeah. why do two stories, why is that double, more than double a one story? That's the anomaly of the system. There's a matrix out there of how this all works, and there's mathematics. I'll get into that in the back end, some of the weird math that's out there for the assessment methodology. A lot of it is, that's a $55 a square foot building to build. You don't have to have an elevator, you don't have to have a fire, to, a fire chase, um, you don't have to have fire staircase, you don't have to have sprinklers, you know, that kind of stuff. Here's one of the reasons why they stopped having Walmarts built in counties, because when they moved out, no one else could take it over. 
They had no place for stores. They had no place for offices. It was a flat-faced yeah. economy where no one could take it over. So it needed at least to have two stories to sell it to someone else. Well, people always ask me, they're like, are you, are you against Walmart? And my answer is no. It's not, I don't hate the player, I hate the game. You know, what's, what's happening is Walmart has figured out how to make the cheapest building possible and depreciate it as quickly as possible. And no they, one else can use it. They don't want anybody else to use it because they want to just drive it into the ground as quickly as possible. So they can walk away with something with zero value and zero basis. And it's just, they're just using the math of the system that's out there financially. But these are all rules that we create. There are fees, right? And the point of this isn't don't have Walmart. It's just invest in the other thing. Well, but no, the, the point is that the new Walmart, they're making them build in two stores. So if they did, did leave the company, because Walmart was built one Walmart here and one Walmart here. After a year, the one that failed, they closed down, and no one else would use it. So the cities in the middle are making them all make it your joint use and, and after use. Well, I, can, I, I can get to that. I'll, okay. I'll get to that. So the, the problem is, is how we look at things and how we compare things. And what happens is we tend to compare things. Imagine comparing cars on a miles per tank basis. Right? If we did, we'd all be driving Ford F-150s at 650 miles per tank, right? Do you, you see how silly that is? Yeah, when we talk about real estate, it's like this $100 million building versus this $10 million building, and everybody gets distracted by the $100 million building. Well, how is it normative? So instead we say miles per gallon, the numbers change. And it changed the cars. We should all be driving BMW Assetas at 70 miles per gallon. 1955 technology beats 2012. Now, that's a very dangerous little vehicle. It's kind of cool. Though. <laughs> this is the front door right here. That's how you get into the thing. So if you, if you get in a car accident, you're pretty much stuck in there. But uh, you see the joke. I mean, this is kind of what we do with real estate. So the more that we can help communities get data and evidence on what's actually happening, we can help them increase their decisions in their local community. Uh, this is the complex napkin sketch of all that. So for Austin, you know, there's, there's technology that gives us data, right? So I can go and do an x-ray of, of all of any of your bodies. I can show you your fillings that you have. So I get hard tissue information with technology. I can change the technology and get soft tissue in information. Same head, different data. Hard tissue, soft tissue. You can even do three-dimensional resonance imaging in the brains. So can we do this with cities? Can we take Austin? This is, uh, this is uh, Travis County. This is the, the value per tank model, right? So you see... Here's downtown right here, but you see some hot spots out here, right? Let's change this to value per acre, and there you go. Now all of a sudden, that's the hot spot. So we've got from non-taxable, which is in gray, low tax value, uh, that around yellow, you get about three million an acre. At about red, you're at 28 million an acre, and purple, you're over $193 million an acre of value. That's what it looks like in 3D. Can you all tell me where downtown is in this model? <laughs> Boom. And what's crazy is, in two dimensions, it's hard to see those steps. You can see it if you're a cartographer, if you, if you read maps all day, but it's hard to communicate that to an audience to see what does it mean to go from one color to another, but that's what it means. This is the, the potency, that's for the county, right? If you apply a uniform <coughs> tax across this, everybody's paying the same tax rate that's paying a lot more. That's just the city limits. So zooming into the city, this is the city's miles per tank. Again, here's downtown. By the way, y'all have a very interesting edge here. Um, you can see what's happened with your annexation pattern. Um, this is the miles per gallon. This is your value per acre. And again, here's the city limits with its 3D model. Um, and again, you can see the spike popping up here. Zooming into just the downtown, you see the potency inside downtown. You're seeing some purples at over 193 million an acre. Um, this is the downtown model, just isolating the downtown. You see some tremendous spikes out of that. Third, what's that? Well, I'll get, I'll get to that, actually. Um, let's kind of skip through this part here. There's other, other visualization tools that we use. We go old school. This is, a, this is a mapping called cartogramming, where you reshape, rather than keeping these same parcels, let's go ahead and reshape the boundary of the parcel to show the value. So you see here that New York is the biggest one on, this, on the map because it's the biggest um, energy uh, seller in the entire country at the time, 10 times the size of, of Wisconsin. So visually you can see that Wisconsin is number 10 
in the process, right? Very quickly can read that map. So this is your county value. Here's your county's cartogram. So your downtown takes up that much land area, but it feels 68 times the potency of that land area. So think about that for a second. If y'all had one person in your office producing 68% <coughs> of your sales or your product or whatever, how would you treat that one person? It's called product efficiency, right? So this is what this is what it feels like to the county. We compared. We had other data sets, so we compared you against Mecklenburg, and uh, which is Charlotte, and and uh, Davidson, which is Nashville. They're kind of like cousins to y'all. It's not. They're not as big as your city, but they're pr they're pretty close. Um, this one is also a state capital, so it matches up with you all that way. Um, from a standpoint of your city. Austin takes up 24% of the land area of the entire county, yet the value of it in the county taxes that are produced are close to 70% close to of the revenue. So again, this is when you just pull into the county's property tax revenues and where the county gets its property taxes, they're getting the lion's share from, the small, from a small portion. Uh, this is kind of hard to see, but this is Nashville compared to you guys. We saw the same spines coming out, both heading toward the university. In Nashville, they were heading toward Vanderbilt, for y'all, you've got a, your main spine of downtown, but you have the secondary ridge line that goes out past the university. So you can actually cultivate more revenue here too. It's an asset, you all know that, but this is what it looks like visually with the data. Um, train lines, Charlotte has a train line, y'all have a train line. Uh, two different animals though, it's not apples to apples. This is the Charlotte line right there. This is your line, it's about uh, three times the distance. Um, there's other di key differences. So Charlotte has a dedica dedicated transit line. It doesn't have to share with freight. Um, they cultivated density closer to their city, so they focused on treating it like a density creator rather than a regional commuter. So it's a different animal that way. There's also shorter stop distances. You can see all the stops here versus how far apart yours are. And then they also have higher frequency. Their train line runs from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. So they use that investment to go where the density already is or where they wanted the density to come from? Kind of both. Um, when, they, when they first ran the train line, they were running through like used car lots and, and surface parking lots. But they basically realized that that corridor could cultivate new buildings and growth. So it would be easy for developers to build there because going by a used car lot. You know? um, this is what it looks like visually. Here's your downtown and here we grab transit-oriented development, like little nodes of what people would walk to a train station. And like a cookie cutter, we just pulled the, all the stations out. So th those are your nodes. Here's Charlotte. And notice the difference in this node here. So let's go back a second. This is your first node. That's Charlotte's first node. So they cultivated a lot more revenue here than you all were able to capture. Um, so on average, if you pull all that real estate, y'all are averaging about $650,000 an acre inside your nodes, while Char Charlotte's harvesting almost double that. So this is a lesson to learn from Charlotte. Um, talk to those folks, see what they did. Is it zoning? Is it developers? How did it work to, to do that? But if aren't there nodes, aren't they starting out in denser areas than what we're sending our train out to? I, no, short answer is no. Um, but, but the other thing is also y'all are talking about a new train line here too. It's going to be a different path and you have opportunities to look at that. But, but there's, if you, go to, if you went to Charlotte 15 years ago and saw where they were running this thing, you'd be like, why are they doing this here? Uh, so here's where you got, y'all actually have a more potent TOD in your downtown versus Charlotte's. But this is where you drop off, is that first train line, that first train stop. And here's Charlotte. So they've been able to cap capitalize on building density within a couple miles of their downtown rather than spreading it further out the way that you all did. And it represents an opportunity in city, but also county taxes. The county's gonna realize that revenue generator as well. So this is averaging about 3.6 million, and that's about a million in value. It's a huge step. Um, there's also, uh, in addition to property taxes, there's retail sales. And this is kind of a little bit weird, but here's the boundary for Travis County. Your state only allows us to get retail taxes by zip code. 
the zip codes cross those boundaries. So we, unfortunately, we have like six different counties in here, but it'll give you an idea of Austin's effect in central Texas. So this is your um, mixed beverage sales. So your downtown's really drinking quite well. Um, and whoever lives across the river, y'all should be thanked for all your beer consumption too. Um, with the second step here, 78704 is zip code. South, South Austin. Yeah. Um, when you get into the hotel taxes, this number two is, is down here at Rosedale Burnett, Burnett area. Um, and then here's your CBD. You caught me on that. Um, this is your retail sales, food and, uh, your food and sales tax. You go and buy a clicker at the tech store or whatever. What's interesting though is, y'all notice what's happening in the map? Look at how wide this is. And we've actually had to shrink the map down to fit that on. And the spike starts to just shoot through the roof. And it necks down even more when you, when you do the combined sales, the putting all the sales together. And that's how downtown's killing it compared to everything else in the whole entire six county region. Um, add in the property taxes and it's getting obscene. So again, this is a way to kind of model and visualize uh, quantitative data, right? Um, we just, y'all didn't see this today. We just messed around with the new one of trying to cartogram with the total valuation. This is what it looks like. So that's what the core area of your city looks like, that zip code. This is what it feels like financially with all the combined taxation. Kind of skip through this. So the general area that you all know is the core of your city, your downtown university area, all the way up to Coney, basically takes up about 1% of the county's land area but produces 12% of the county's revenue. So it's incredibly potent. And just to kind of flip through some examples, like everybody knows the Walmart, right? So this is your average Walmart at about $780,000 an acre of value, right? Which is more value per acre than the domain. So the Walmart is actually more tax productive from a property standpoint than the domain. Um, this is the Samsung R&D campus at about $670,000 per acre. This is the 3M campus at about 540,000 per acre, less value than the Walmart on a per acre basis. Um, this is a, I love this name, South Park Meadows. This is the meadow right here. Um, 1.3 million an acre, let's say, compared to the Walmart. Barton Creek Mall, at a, let's call it 2 million an acre. When you get into the downtown, you expect to see this, right? Huge potency, 123 million, in 108 million, again compared to the, let's say $800,000 Walmart. What's kind of insane about this is, I wasn't expecting, I was expecting this one to kind of be more potent. But you don't have to be a tall building to be productive. You, know, the, you can see 42 million an acre, 31 million an acre, and this one's, this one's 30, 30 million. The, even this low rise building is, an, is a handsome producer of tax density, that infill that you have. Um, you don't have to be downtown to be productive. This is the uh, Whole Foods headquarters at 19 million an acre. Again, compared to the $800,000 Walmart. This is some infill happening on South Con Congress at 9 million an acre, right? But this is my favorite one. This is, you asked about the, the biggest producer. 487 million an acre oh. of value. Oh my God. For the Austonian. <laughs> Again, to put that in perspective, this is 620 times the Walmart. And potency. So uh, the developer was at the lunch today, and I told everybody they should give him a big hug. I mean, he's just shoveling money and taxes out the door on this thing. It's not a one acre lot. Um, I think it's I think it's smaller than an acre. So if you had an acre over. Right so that's that's the big buildings. You kind of expect that. What's kind of awesome is the historic architecture too. That y'all have this lasting value in your community. It's this heritage that was built by your great great grandparents, right? So, this is a shot down Congress from 1912. The Scarborough was built in 1909. There it is. 38 million an acre. 38.5 million an acre. So think about that from a portfolio standpoint. If you could have a commodity that was a high level producer for over a hundred years, is the Walmart going to be there a hundred years from now? The South Park Meadow is going to be here 100 years from now. So the development patterns that are happening in your community today are the legacy that you leave behind for your children and grandchildren tomorrow. This is my favorite building, the Littlefield. 
60 million an acre. Double to Scarborough, right across the street. Uh, this building, this is the postcard from 1886 when this was built. Still producing 68 million an acre in value. That's incredible potency. So just to run through what your bar chart looks like, this is your county taxes per acre. Here's county single family right here at $3,000. Here's the Walmart at $4,000. Here's the average city at $5,000. So the average city resident is paying more in county taxes than a Walmart. This is, uh, let's see, let's BD Riley's. This is your average for downtown, producing about $100,000 an acre in county taxes. Scarborough, Littlefield, the Driscoll, Frostbank Tower. And this is kind of interesting. That's Frostbank Tower at, let's say, $539,000 an acre in taxes. That's the Intercontinental. This wasn't our first bar chart we made. We actually made this one first. Um, and then this building was just too obscene. It's producing $2.4 million in county taxes per, uh, per acre. It's coming out of the Austonian. Isn't that crazy? So we had to remove it because it distorted the chart. So just to recap, if you had 1.1 acre of that, it would equal the entire 20 acre Walmart, apples to apples. If you had 1.81 acres of this, the, uh, the, uh, the Intercontinental, <coughs> it would equal the entire 172 acre South Park Meadows. From a cash flow standpoint, y'all get that? If you had seven acres of that, you would equal the entire 175 acres uh, Galleria out at Back Cove or B Cove. Sorry, DK. <laughs> I keep on messing that up. So one of the fun things about the data that we had is we actually had Gwinnett County, Georgia. Anybody been to Gwinnett County, Georgia, or no Gwinnett? Are you, are you from there? Okay. So the people in Gwinnett County, Georgia, when they when they hired us, they were just like, no, no, we're rural, we're not part of Atlanta, we're, we're rural. And so they basically adopted this 100% suburban county idea, just suburbanizing like crazy. So here's, here's the county, there's Atlanta. And uh, this is DeKalb County, which is, splits Atlanta in two. And they're out here just developed, so y'all have heard of these cities like uh, Lawrenceville, anyone? You probably know it, but. It's a town of 20,000 people. This county is 800,000 people in the county. So from a people per square mile basis, that's DeKalb County, which splits Atlanta. Here's Gwinnett, 800,000 people. So it's about 18, 1,800 people per square mile. This is, this is you guys at about 1,000 people per square mile. Gwinnett County, when you go back to Atlanta, tell them that they're denser than in Austin, Texas. They're also denser than Charlotte, Nashville, Raleigh, Asheville. It kind of blew my mind. I'm like, there's the data. I mean, you guys are denser. How the hell did you achieve it? When we did their model, this is their value per acre. This is the peak of their model. Eight, eight, eight million bucks of value per acre. And here's you guys. So you're actually cultivating more wealth out of your downtown than anything they have in their entire county from a value perspective. Here's their model. It's just like a big spread of yellow. There's no spot there. There's no center to it. Like, you all saw the spikes, right? This is this is their model. It's like a big, thick carpet. Nothing. This is what we typically see. So with Chapel Hill, you can tell where Main Street is. You can tell where Main Street is in Carborough. You can even see it in Hillsboro. We didn't see that in their model. So just to kind of have fun with it, we wanted to make like a um, like what's their pulse, their economic pulse, their heart rate. So here's Nashville, Austin. In Gwinnett, 650,000 people, 1 million people, 800,000 people. Here's the pulses. So they're peaking out at 192 million. You guys are peaking out at 46 million. And they're like flatlining at 8 million. They're just going broke, basically, just spread out. Did y'all get this? Again, it's just using computer technology to visualize quantitative data and let people see the effect of their land use decisions. So just to close, I mean, so y'all commented about policies and stuff like that. There are behavioral tricks that make me behave a certain way as a developer. In England, it used to be taxed on the number of windows you had. In over 100 years, people started boarding up their windows to avoid the taxes. They changed the tax policy. In France, you were taxed below your roof line. So here's your roof line. So this was essentially a tax bonus, right? 
So when the assessor goes out there, you're like, you can't tax me for this. It's clearly the roof, right? There wasn't a design guideline that made Paris become that way. It was a tax law. As we look at land, we see the same thing over and over again, and it blows our mind that no one uses computer technology to do analytics. This is, you've got two values in real estate. You've got your value of your dirt, and you've got your value of the building on top of the dirt, right? This is your improvement value. This is your dirt. There's two values if you pull your tax bill. You'll see both of them in there. We just get the computer to turn off all the buildings, and we do the value per acre of the dirt. Right away, you see that's blue. You cross the street, you go to orange. So right, you go from $15,000 an acre to $35,000 an acre. You double the value crossing the street. As I was presenting this in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the assessor was sitting in the front row, and she raised her hand immediately. She's like, you don't understand. And I said, we don't understand. She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. Think about that. So if I have a half mile of road here, a half mile of road here, another quarter mile, quarter mile, I've got three miles of infrastructure. This person's got about 200 feet. Three miles of infrastructure, biggest site on the street, which probably means I have the most capacity to build stuff. If I build more capacity, I have more trips, more car accidents, more fire calls, more commerce, more theft, police calls. I get more infrastructure, you're gonna give me a discount rate? She's like, yeah, yeah, that's our standard. And I asked her, I said, where'd you get the standard? Did, did Moses deliver it to you? I mean, what's, where'd this come from? And this is why I presented at the International Association of Assessing Officers. I asked them where it came from, they didn't know. They're like, oh, you should talk to Larry Clark, he could probably change that. Like, it's seriously that insane. That's how the world operates. So there's a financial incentive to squandering real estate. Where do you find those big parcels? Not here. And if you have property downtown, you're actually taxed at a much higher rate, even though that road has been paid for 100 years ago. Did y'all get that? The reason why sprawl happens are these numerous policies that are built into the system to reward that behavior. <coughs> so we see this in Austin. I mean, check some of this stuff out. Look at this one block right there. We've got people at one corner of the block at over $5 million an acre for the dirt. And just by going diagonally across the block, we drop down to less than $400,000 an acre. This is a commercial property. And you can see like these two guys here, just by crossing the property line, we've gone from about a million dollars down to about less than 400,000 of value. And then here's residential in here. There's no rhyme nor reason to it. And it's because of this calculus that they have inside the system. No one does the analytics. So these aren't invisible market forces that are driving me as a developer to do these developments. These are policies that have built up and accreted over time that manipulate the market. And sometimes the policies hurt. You know, you can change them though. They're your policies, and this is your community, and you need to work with them. So just to recap and close, your county is worth $111 billion. Think about that. As a corporation, your county is 15 times all of your professional sports teams in your entire state combined. 15 times that. Your city is worth 10 times that. Your downtown is worth $4 billion, which are more than all of these teams. Or for another way of looking at it, considering the week, you're about 7.4 spurs in value for your downtown. Let that wash over you for a second. I, 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 have a, I work in a real estate development company. We have a nightclub that's a tenant in one of our buildings. We had, a, we had a debate when we decided to go from plastic cups to compostable soy, soy based corn cups. Two cent difference in cups. We talked about it because we had to know the math about it. Do you think the owner of the Spurs knows Tim Duncan's towel bill? Of course. Do you understand what it costs for a street or what you have to pay for for your downtown services? These are all things that you have to bring to the attention of your community. And if you're not collecting the data, you can't manage it. So, um, you know, I'm going to close with my favorite analogy. We measure potato chips, for crying out loud. I can tell you the sodium content in your potato chips. Understand the cost of your buildings and your land use patterns and the choices that you make. I have to watch my diet. I can't eat key lime pie every night. You know, so these are all things that you have to do and just do the math. And